to a new video. I want to start by apologizing because I'm not looking at the camera because I set up the light improperly and I was too lazy to set it up correctly and the light was basically blasting into my eyes every time I looked into the camera. <laughs> uh, it's been a very very difficult year and I'm still not able to do the work that I want to do and it's also the 10th anniversary of DC Music School but I haven't been able to make content for it since December 2019. It's rather mentally painful and I try to make best of this difficult situation. But at least I'm very happy to have been able to convince some musicians that I like to share a big house together and we've been uh, shedding a lot together. So this video that you just watched was me and my roommates having fun. Let's get right into the content. So here's a video that I didn't think I'd make as many people have talked about it at great length already, both on YouTube and on blogs, articles, social media, etc. So it's the great debate about modes, chord scales, and such in jazz education. Reading through the various discussions, I sometimes feel that both sides are not always fully seeing the big picture and understanding certain nuances that I consider quite important. Actually, a lot of people often misunderstand me as well and they think that I'm anti-scales or modes. And that's not exactly true. Everything for me depends on what one is going for. But before all that, once again, folks, please like and subscribe. It makes a huge difference. It's been a very difficult year for artists for obvious reasons. And if you want to support me financially, well, I have two courses that are related to this topic that I'm very proud of. They're on SoundSlice, so you'll find the link in the description box. One of them is a video on jazz guitar harmony that in my opinion is quite different uh, from the traditional jazz harmony you are likely to learn in music school. It is harmony taught from a historical perspective, uh, starting from early jazz, which already most music schools don't really talk about, and explains how certain things came to be across generations. Another course for SoundSlice that I released uh, is a course on developing bebop lines the way the old masters did. And again, it's from a historical and organic point of view. It's not about modes or scales, but about understanding how to decorate harmonies. Uh, in both courses, there is this kind of unifying theme, which is a concept that I call harmonic direction. So in tonal music, which is what most jazz standards are in, it is less about the exact chords than it is about knowing where the music is going and understanding the meaning behind the chords. So if those are topics that... Uh, interest you, please check them out. It makes a huge difference for me. Thanks for the support. And of course, there's also DC Music School where you can check out the courses that I've produced for many artists. Okay, let's dive right into it. The first thing that I'd say is that in terms of learning jazz improvisation, I personally honestly didn't spend too much time practicing scales or arpeggios. As far as scales go, um, of course, I did work on just having some basic shape down for muscle memory purposes. Uh, at one point, I did work a little bit on basic arpeggio shapes as well. However, I should note that when I played over standards when I was starting out, someone correctly made the statement that I played the changes, but I didn't play any music or lines. And the final coffin in the nail is when I started getting into Django Reinhardt. I was improvising over tunes, and everything that I played was theoretically correct in terms of scales, modes, arpeggios, and whatnot. 
But once again, it was not music. Not only was it not music, but I could really clearly hear the difference between what Django was doing and later other gypsy jazz musicians and what I was doing. So in terms of what to play, even though gypsy jazz musicians are not doing exactly what Django did, um, I did hear a common vocabulary. So that was really what changed everything for me and basically turned me into a quote-unquote self-taught musician because at the time there was no one to teach me this vocabulary. So I started immersing myself in the language and lifting everything that, that, I, that interested me. I would basically take songs that I was interested in and listen to recordings and figure out what Django and other musicians were doing. And I started to see common shapes and concepts. Since I was a beginner, I would often simplify some of these concepts and turn them into quote-unquote copy and paste licks that I could just plug in, you know, C major, play this, D major, play this, etc. Um, I did this for quite a while and I, I acquired quite a lot of vocabulary that even sometimes people would call me an encyclopedia. <laughs> Today, to be honest, I don't think that um, I remember many of these quote-unquote copy and paste style licks anymore. They're mostly forgotten. However, the sound and the concepts are now deeply ingrained in my ears. And I can on the spot create any kind of new phrase of my own based on all these years of listening. And these phrases that I create will be quote unquote in the style. And in the beginning, I didn't always understand what I played, what I heard, like and how it worked. But slowly and organically, my ears came to understand them at a much deeper level and Everything is just generally in my head now. Like when I play a C major chord, I hear so many things. What else do I hear? Right? So basically, for the most part, the language is all in my ears, in my head. And this physical aspect of playing the instrument is just transferring what I hear onto the instrument. And since those days, I have also explored other styles of jazz, you know, mainly older styles. But from Django, it got me into Louis Armstrong, Sidney Bechet, Kanye West, Charlie Christian, Lester Young, and all those players. Uh, basically all these old school players. And these old school players then led me to the, the era right after, the bebop players. And I did investigate just a little bit of post-bop as well. Furthermore, because of my DC music school, and especially in the last year of the pandemic when I had quite a lot of free time, I studied a lot, a lot, a lot. Basically, I, I haven't counted really, but I, I can definitely say that I've investigated well over 1,000 jazz solos. Lots of them coming from the gypsy jazz tradition, of course, but quite a lot of bebop as well. And this basically opened my eyes and gave me a greater understanding about the historical development of jazz improvisation versus conventional wisdom that you are likely to be taught in music schools nowadays. So the question about whether you should study scales, modes, or arpeggios. Well, the quick answer, it depends. Right off the bat, I would say that learning anything is always good in theory. And if it pleases you to learn something, there, there's certainly no harm. The more important issue, in my opinion, is what are your goals? And in my opinion, this is where a lot of students may have certain difficulties. A lot of people are not sure what their goals are when they're starting out. I would even say that a lot of the younger folks get into jazz in a quote-unquote unnatural way. That is, it was thrust upon them somehow. Maybe school jazz band, orchestra, music camp, or a teacher. And, you know, it was a bit of the same for me when I was younger. And the big life-changing moment, as I said, was when I got into Django Reinhardt. For the very first time in my life, there was a very clear path and a clear goal. I wanted to get as much as I could from Django. And to do that, well, I had no choice but to immerse myself in his musical universe. The major difference in this is that the other kind of student doesn't know what they want. So they don't know what they should be practicing. They can only practice what others suggest that they practice. For me, I didn't care about anything else but Django, and that's what I wanted, and that's what I went for. The answer to my questions were all in the recordings. Now, of course, eventually, after some time, my appetite, my musical appetite expanded, and I got into all the other jazz styles that I mentioned. 
And to this day though, I would say my personal biggest specialty would be the older styles of jazz. From having investigated over a thousand jazz solos, but not even jazz solos, I also investigated what the rhythm sections were doing, what the bass lines were doing, and uh, what the chordal accompaniment was doing, and I learned so much, so much. The truth is out there in the recordings, you just have to do the work. Nowadays, a lot of jazz education falls under what education uh, experts call the banking system. So it is a system of transmission whereby teachers deposit information into the blank minds of sis, uh, students. And then it repeats over and over across generations. And that's basically how conventional wisdom is created. The alternative learning system would be a problem-based uh, learning model. So these are actually all terms from the education field apparently. So problem-based learning, um, this model is essentially all the work that I did. I went straight to the source, I tried to question why things are taught the way they are taught. And when you go straight to the source, the answer is just there. Um, you just have to have the ears for it and also a certain bit of knowledge to make sense of it all. Now, talking about music schools is a huge can of worms that's probably best reserved for another video. And if you're interested in such a video, I'll make one. But uh, very quickly, I'll say that obviously not all music schools are the same. Furthermore, there are many teachers out there that insist on developing critical uh, thinking skills for their students. But I can also say from experience that I have had a lot of uh, confused music school graduates come to me for therapy <laughs> because they left schools a bit more confused because of all the contradictory statements they received. Contradictory because some teacher would say, oh no, this is the right way. My way is the right way. And then others would say, no, 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 that's not the right way. My way is the right way. And behind all that, some students some, um, had their own personal intuition and some teachers would be saying, telling them, no, your intuition is wrong, this is actually how it has to be. So over the years, I've had a lot of uh, people come to me for lessons, um, music school graduates, working professional musicians, uh, grad school, PhD, quite a lot. And they, they come from, <laughs> to me because they know that I've done all this work. And basically, I explained to them the historical context behind all these controversial statements. And this basically is the answer to the question as to whether one should work on scales, modes, in jazz improvisation. It depends on the sound that you are looking for. All methods are actually quite valid depending on your goals. And from a historical perspective, at the very least, I think knowing the basic major and minor scales are worth investigating. And it... From that, it's enough to build some ba basic um, muscle memory on your instrument. Keep in mind that the first music school that offered an actual bachelor's degree in jazz didn't exist until 1947. And then it took about maybe 25 years for just about 15 or so schools to offer the same program. And I would say that from that era of the early 1970s, that's when everything started to explode in terms of jazz education. At, in schools. In Canada, for example, the first degree uh, for jazz was in the early 1980s. Besides getting a degree in jazz, of course, there was jazz curriculum to a certain extent. Anyway, nowadays, conventional wisdom dictates that this is the natural path of a jazz student. You go to a music school, you graduate. But in the old days, this path never existed. The education that many early jazz musicians received if they even did, was based on general classical music education. So basically you had basic harmony, basic scales, and for the rest though, the, the young jazz musician was on their own. But they did have an extensive community, and they had the benefit that at that time they were playing the popular music of their day. So basically the community was their main school. And what this results is in very diverse approaches to music that sometimes contradict what students nowadays are taught in music schools. So to give you an example, Charlie Christian, the guitar player, could not have developed his signature sound if he had been taught about chord scale theory. He, based, he only had a basic understanding of music theory, and the rest was his own imagination, his own intuition. To give you an example, there's uh, this tune, I Surrender Dear, that he recorded with uh, Benny Goodman. So I Surrender Dear is a really, really nice old jazz tune that not many people play nowadays. And it goes like this. Okay, that's just like the first few bars. 
And so there's one part where it goes D minor to E7 to A minor to D7. So over the E7, um, Charlie plays this line. He thinks E9. And then to get to the A minor, he thinks A minor 6. So if you're a guitar player, check out, I'm going to remove this finger. E9, A minor 6. The exact same shape. And he does the exact same shape but over different chord qualities. So check this out, over E7, then over A minor, D7. So over that chord progression. You just basically use one shape for three chords. In this one shape over the E7, according to chord scale theory, is the incorrect chord scale. It's the wrong mode. If you have, if you have to put a label to it, he's thinking, what, E Mixolydian or B Dorian. And then here, A Dorian, if you will. But again, he was not thinking that way at all. It was just, he had a basic understanding of chords and arpeggios, and then boom, use the same shape. Charlie Parker, um, in his recording of All of Me, I think with Lenny Tristano in the key of A flat. So over on the second chord over C7, at one point he does a line that goes something like this. Okay. So if Charlie Parker had gone to had been taught quote unquote the, the chord scale system, he would not have come up with, with what he did. What did he do? Well, again, Charlie Parker knew about basic chords. He certainly knew about this concept that I called harmonic direction that I talk about in my courses. So he knew where the music was going and he knew how to decorate chord tones. And basically over the C7, he was thinking of G minor because of the shared chord tones. And that's where he came up with one of his signature phrases. So G minor over C7, that suggests, in, in terms of a music school theory, that suggests C mixolydian, or if you want G dorian. So that's this line. Then we have this. This is kind of like the correct chord scale, quote unquote, C mixo flat 9 flat 13, or for you metal heads, uh, C phrygian dominant. I'm not good with names. <laughs> so. off to F7. So all that was from that other mode. So basically you have two modes within the same phrase. But again, he was not thinking in terms of modes. He was thinking about how to decorate the chord tones and that he had to get from C7 to F7. So it was knowing how to decorate the chord tones and then how to voice lead to F7. All these labels that we have today came later. So it's the same thing with what we call bebop scales. Now there's a category of scales called bebop scales and like they have different bebop scales. But as I mentioned in my bebop vocabulary course, in those days, it was just a simple major or minor scale and musicians would just chromatically connect chord tones by intuition. So it doesn't matter that those terms didn't exist back in those days. Well, it depends. I think actually it's a really good thing that now we have very specific terms for very specific, specific things. But if we don't understand the origin and the historical context, some, student, uh, some students end up very, very confused. And they apply, they think of those scales uh, in a more complicated way than need, need be. I'll give you an example. So I was hanging out at a jazz camp one time, this one time in band camp. Um, there was a young kid practicing improvisation over a black backing track to Blue Bossa. And he was struggling very, very hard. So I asked him what he was trying to do. So he showed me that he had been taught that the first chord was C minor and that this, the corresponding uh, chord scale, the mode, was C aeolian. And then the second chord was F minor, so you had to play F dorian. Then you had D half diminished, so it's D locrian. Then you have G7, which is G mixo, you know. And he was just struggling so hard just making the changes. So I told him, well, do you know the C minor scale? 
said, yeah, no problem. So I, t I told him, why don't you just try using the C minor scale and use your ears. And then when it gets to the G7, maybe just change this one note, B flat, to a B natural. And suddenly he was improvising effortlessly over the first part of the song. If we want to use the chord scale system to improvise over blue bassa, then we have to understand why we do it. Not why, why, why. You guys like Cool Whip? Anyway, uh, basically, you do this so that you understand chord tones and their possible extensions. And that is the sole purpose. But students like this kid didn't know that, and they were just told what they had to play over those scales, uh, over those chords, sorry. And that's why they were so confused. So if your purpose is to learn the chord tones, then actually arpeggios will teach you these very basic chord tones. And at a simplified level, if you know a basic C minor scale and you know the arpeggios, like C minor, F minor, D minor, 7 flat 5, and G7, well, that will give you the same information as studying the modes. And just on G7, you maybe have to change that B flat to a B natural. If you do this, you end up basically playing all those modes that I mentioned already. And that's what that kid was doing. He was playing all those modes, but he was just using his ears because all of it was in the same key and you just had to make that one little adjustment on the G7 chord. Even then, if you truly want to understand music and what I call harmonic direction, you also have to understand that D minor 7th of life and G7 are historically the same. They're related. They serve the same purpose. That is, um, they both want to resolve to C minor and basically, to simplify things, D minor 7 flat 5 is a G sus chord. Kind of a special G sus chord. So it's all a voice leading thing. What this basically means is that if you're using the chord scale approach, instead of Locrian on D minor 7 flat 5, you can already be playing the same G mixo flat 9 flat 13, which is really just C harmonic minor, but with a kind of a G chord under it. Again, this is if you were going for the chord scale approach. But if you look at older players, they would actually play lines like this. Let's say we're on the C minor chord in blue bassa. So what is this? Basically it's a C melodic minor scale, but is it? So it starts off C melodic minor starting from the note G. Then, well, this is not from melodic minor. This is from either harmonic minor or aeolian, if we're thinking in terms of modes. But really, this line is not coming from that. It's really coming from connecting chord tones. We want to get from G to C on C minor. And a nice way to connect is that. It's from melodic minor. And then from there, we want to get to G. And this G, we want to give more emphasis to it. So we do this. Gives this dark quality as opposed to which you can also do. But this is the line. So if you want to do it like very uh, theoretical, yeah, it starts off melodic minor connecting chord tones and then after it switches to aeolian. But really it's just a sound. A sound that, a sound, how do you say, um, more than just a sound, it's just decorating chord tones. That's what I meant to say. And then improvisers may do the exact same line over F minor. So it's a copy and paste of the same idea. And all this breaks the rules of traditional chord scale theory. Why did people do things like this? Well, because a lot of the old players were not taught this um, standardized me method of teaching. They just knew their basic chords and their basic scales and they used their own intuition. So they, they figured, all right, um, in this blue bass, you have C minor and F minor. I'll just play the exact same idea over both chords. And that's it. Basically, if it sounds good, then do it. And in those days, they learned a lot of songs. And a lot of these songs from the, are from the same era. Therefore, they have similar construction. And so by learning a lot of songs, they learn about what I what I call harmonic direction, which is a huge thing. And this is something that I think a lot of uh, jazz students um, nowadays are missing. They don't know how to interpret chord progressions, or rather, they only know how to interpret them in one way.
So in the old days, chord progressions were interpreted in many ways leading to different sounds. And it possibly gave birth to ambiguous chord progressions that had multiple possible interpretations. Like uh, this chord progression that Cole Porter liked. You see that night and day, just one of those things. Um, quite a lot of songs use this descending chromatic chord progression. And if you want to understand the history behind this chord progression, you got to check out my harmony course. The point I'm making though is that it's purposely ambiguous. So you, as an improviser, you can go in a number of different directions. And this is what a lot of the old players did. I can often tell who really investigated style and who learned from the banking model. And that is essentially, in my opinion, one thing that a lot of music students are missing. They are taught from the banking model that teaches them theoretical concepts, but many have not done the listening work of understanding style. The good students obviously will have done that. And this is something that you can only learn on your own because you have to immerse yourself in the language by listening a lot and actually just figuring out what's going on. So an example that I see quite often, um, one way that I can tell it's a music school graduate <laughs> playing uh, Cherokee is they have the lead sheet in front of them and at one point when you have this A flat chord, A flat 7 chord, I see them playing an A flat 7 arpeggio or an A flat mixolydian. Now that is certainly one possible thing that you can do. But if they do this every single time, it shows that they came strictly from the banking education system. In reality, this A flat 7 is the flat 7 dominant, or part of the what people call also the, the, the backdoor 2-5. It's a term that I learned recently because I've been hanging a lot with uh, music school graduates. <laughs> Historically though, this was just an E flat minor chord. So it's basically E flat to E flat minor to B flat major. Classic 4-4 four, four minor to 1. And when you listen to a lot of older improvisers, you hear this sound. Basically E flat minor and A flat 7 are the same chords. A flat 7 is just a fancy substitute for the 4 minor. Again, if you want to know more about this, check out my harmony course. So basically the banking model of education is passed down from generation to generation without people really questioning why. So this results in kind of historical inaccuracies in scholarly material as well. And not to like criticize anyone, but there, there's, there are some prominent jazz musicians who have made lots of transcriptions of famous jazz artists. But when I see the, the, the chords that they, they notate above the solos, I see that they just copied what was on the real book. So one such example of many out there would be Charlie Parker improvising over Cherokee. There are a lot of transcriptions of uh, this solo on the internet, uh, some by very respected people. And when you see the chords that are written above the solo, it's often copied from the real book. When in fact, the rhythm section was doing something entirely different. And that's what I meant when I did this work of listening to so many jazz solos, but not just the jazz solo, but also what the rhythm section was doing. This is a huge thing for me. The changes of the real book are more complicated than what was originally going on. And if you really want to analyze Charlie Parker's solo over it, then I think it'd be better to show the original chords, to, share, uh, to show where his ideas were coming from, and then to see where he was superimposing other chords. So basically for a few decades, the older method was not based on chord scales, but on basic understanding of harmony, basic understanding of major and minor scales, and then using one's own creativity to create their own improvisation system. So basically every jazz musician had their own take on things, which is why you have all these artists with their own unique style. Of course, many learned from each other as well because they were part of a community, and then they had certain common traits as well. The interest in more advanced concepts and scales, um, I guess started sometime in the 50s. And apparently George Russell's book on Lydian chromatic concept had a huge impact on progressive musicians like uh, Miles Davis, Bell Evans, and others. 
And even this book doesn't really talk about modes the way we talk about them today. So I don't know exactly when that actually started to happen, the way we teach modes nowadays. But I suspect that a lot of that had to do with music schools wanting to standardize music education. So this is something that I would say, at least by the 1970s, started to be uh, commonly taught. It was probably one of the staples of jazz music education. So basically, this system came quite a number of decades after the beginning of jazz improvisation. Now, there's a pianist, Ethan Iverson, I hope I pronounced his name right, who has a fascinating article on the topic of chord scales, and I'll link it in the description box. On the pro-modes camp, people often cite John Coltrane. And they're not wrong, but what they often forget is that before John Coltrane started studying all the fancy stuff, he still came from the old school. And the old school is the foundation for everything that he did later. And basically, Ethan Iverson talks about this in his article. So check it out. Uh, another guy, Bill Evans, apparently was a self-professed expert on boogie-woogie and old, all these old piano styles, like these old jazz swing styles. Apparently, it was such a huge part of his early life, and I'm sure it must have somehow affected how he played later as well. And this is very different from what a lot of jazz students do, which is to take only from the new without exploring the original. And there's actually nothing wrong with that per se, but it creates a brand new sound. And under the banking model, if you keep repeating this pro process and you teach this to the new generation, uh, you become more and more removed from the original. And again, absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's totally normal, but it just leads to a completely, completely different sound after a few generations. The only thing that would be wrong is if you try to explain the original model using the latest model, which doesn't work, as I've shown you with uh, Charlie Christian and Charlie Parker. But this is often what is taught in music schools. Some players, well many players actually, with good ears and good intuitions have naturally absorbed the older styles as well. But they continue to teach the new model because of the effect of the banking system. It's just tradition. You teach it because that's how you were taught and that's it. The problem with this is that, okay, people with good ears and intu intuition will still learn quote-unquote correctly no matter what, but other people who need more help will end up very confused. And I've had many students come to me very confused. The new model created a new sound, and there are a lot of players who embrace the sound. So if that's, what is, that's something you're going for, then definitely learn that way. So Mike Stern is probably one of the biggest uh, example of someone who really embraces the chord scale concept. Um, obviously, he, he has transcribed some bebop, he's listened to it. I know that he has like a stack of transcriptions that he's made over the years. But at the heart of his playing and his teaching is this chord scale concept. So listen to Mike Stern play over standards and compare that to the older players like Joe Pass or Wes Montgomery or Charlie Parker. And it's a totally different sound, right? So again, it's not a question of better or worse. If you're going for this chord scale sound, like if you're into Meister and you really love what he does, then obviously you should use that approach because that's the approach that he uses. If you're going for a much older sound, then I would suggest the older model. And of course, maybe it can be a mix of the two. Basically, every jazz musician has to find their own approach. And as I, as I just said, it can be a hybrid approach. The key thing is to know what sound you want to go for, and then you just go for it. One final thing I want to say is that here we are talking about what to play, but what is also important is expression and why you choose to play X or Y. When you take certain difficult songs like uh, Wayne Shorter songs, you have these crazy chords. These post-bop songs with non-functional chords seem to dictate the need for the chord scale approach. And actually, it probably is the best way to teach, quote unquote, how to properly play these songs. But if you did what I, act, what I did and actually listened to how Wayne Shorter himself improvises over his own challenging songs, you'll notice that he quite often played, quote unquote, wrong. And students will then be asking, oh, what was he thinking here? What's the theory behind this? Well, actually, maybe the only person who could actually answer that would be Wayne himself. But it's also possible that he was just playing by intuition and hoping for the best, just expressing himself on his instrument in the moment. And the thing is, 
you wouldn't necessarily know that what he played was quote-unquote incorrect unless you sat down and analyzed each individual note. So it's basically your brain telling you that he was playing wrong, not your ears. And when you casually listen, I think for many people, certainly myself, things sounded quite fine. I would even dare say that nowadays there are a lot of people who can quote-unquote play way in shorter tunes better than the man himself in terms of how to play correctly. But art and expression are something else altogether. Uh, off the top of my head, the same thing happens in Autumn Leaves, uh, the, the recording that Miles Davis did. So over a D7 chord at some point, he's playing notes from a, the G minor scale. So completely, quote unquote, playing the wrong scale over D7. Of course, only he himself could ever answer why he decided to do what he did. But I, I would wager that what was more important for him is the general expression in the moment. And he'll play things that are theoretically incorrect, but at the same time, you wouldn't necessarily know unless you really thought about it. So yeah, expression, uh, being in the moment is another topic of its own, but it's well worth reflecting in a world where many students are always trying to categorize and analyze everything. Folks, the answer is out there in the music itself. Just go and listen. Um, hopefully this clears some of the confusion. And be wary of scholarly articles as well. I encourage you to question everything and to go directly to the source whenever possible. Ultimately, that is where the truth lies if you're interested in knowing it. Okay, let's do a recap of all this. Here's the good news. The new and old ways are not mutually exclusive. That means you can certainly work on both. And many people who were heavily educated in the new way still learn from the old way as well. I'd even say that my favorite players have a nice mix of all this. The old way is basically having an elementary understanding of harmony, major chords, minor chords, dominant chords, and basic scales, major, minor. And then of course, understanding where chord progressions are going. And this is achieved by spending a lot of time listening to a lot of players that you like, not just listening to their lines, but also listening to what is going on behind the lines, the rhythm section. The advantages of this approach is that basically the old way teaches you a lot about style and interpretation. It develops your ears to hear and understand vocabulary in an intimate way. Like you have a physical kind of connection to it. It teaches your ear your ears to hear chords, makes you realize that there are so many ways to harmonize a song, teaches you a lot about harmonic di direction, which is one of the key components of bebop music. It allows you to specialize and get really good at something. And over time, it builds your ears and intuition, and you can then create your own style based on this solid proven foundation. It's, in some ways, a simplified and organic way of learning and it really promotes your internal sense of intuition. Potential disadvantages. So depending on your learning abilities, it could be very difficult to make sense of what you are hearing. Without guidance, you may essentially be lost. For this method to work well, uh, you really have to know what sound you're looking for. So for instance, for me, it was all about Django Reinhardt. I wanted to know what Django was, was doing. And if you're, don't, if you're just starting out and you don't even know what songs or which artists you like, you may feel overwhelmed. So this old way that relies a lot on our intuition on developing your ears, it might mean that you may end up not being so theoretically competent, which may or may not matter. It could certainly matter if you want to teach and then you didn't have words to communicate certain things. But this old way mainly works best for traditional styles. One disadvantage is that there are no shortcuts. You have to constantly immerse yourself in the music and you have to do all this work yourself. Certain styles are more intellectual and may require more knowledge. And unless you have the absolute best ears, then you may not be as well equipped for certain styles of music that require more discipline and more intellectual and intel, intellectual approach, sorry. There's actually a recording, a video of a very, very, very famous jazz musician who, who learned by ear, who was self-taught. And he's on stage with uh, other musicians who, and for some reason, they started playing a really, really complicated uh, post-bop song. And this ear player, despite having perfect pitch and really some of the, one of the best ears, basically gave up, just did... I don't know what to do. Some of these songs require training in the new way. 
What that means is that a lot of these older players had their quote-unquote imperfections, so to speak. And last but not least, this style of learning may not necessarily teach you about art lining changes the way music schools tend to, which is not necessarily a big deal. What this old method teaches is uh, the, ha the harmonic direction approach that I talk about in my sound slice course. Check it out. So the new way, the pros. Well, it's a heavy intellectual, academic, systematic training in mode, scales, arpeggios, theory, and all that stuff. You learn a lot of terminology and you end up with fancy ways to be able to describe many things. It's very useful for more intellectual and conceptual styles and having a lexicon for teaching is great as well. A lot of the training tends to be conceptual and you end up with conceptual shortcuts that with enough training develops a certain level of consistency that allows you to theoretically play over just about anything. And you may get really good at nailing changes. In that way, you are theoretically trained to be versatile. And if you work hard on this, you also probably end up being someone with a lot of general abilities beyond those of the purely old school players. In some ways, it's this elite training pr program, so to speak. Let's talk about disadvantages. If this is your only way of learning, then you probably won't learn about style. You may not develop your ears for specific genres as well. Everything is very intellectual, and you learn a lot of terminology and may even op overcomplicate things that were originally simple. And while if you train hard enough, you can play over anything, it doesn't mean it'll sound good. Your deep training understanding of harmony scales will allow you to play may maybe over any bluegrass tune, but you might not sound anything like a bluegrass player. You can play over a blues, but you might not sound anything like a blues player. You were theoretically training to be versatile, but really, you don't really sound like anything in many styles. So you essentially play in a box, so to speak. It's also possible that you end up being over overstimulated and don't know what to make of all this training. These were two extreme and very dry looks at the two methods. The truth is, I think most people fall somewhere in between. It is obviously a spectrum. And while I do personally believe the old way uh, tends to yield tremendous, tremendous benefits, the new way also has its benefits. It depends on your style of learning and what you want to do. If you want to learn pure bebop, then maybe you shouldn't spend too much time working on all the fingerings of every mode, especially if you only have so much time in a day. You'd best be working on the way on bebop the way a lot of the bebop players were working on bebop. Go and just start learning bebop lines. Um, get a few scale, basic scale and arpeggio shapes under your fingers, and that's pretty much it. If on the other hand, you absolutely don't care about bebop or anything like that, you want to play more open-ended styles of jazz or music, then certainly the new way offers quite a lot of possibilities. And actually mix in with a little bit of listening of good musicians, you can be well equipped for that new style as well. So I want to be clear that I'm generalizing the contemporary jazz education system. Because obviously, as I mentioned previously, there are a lot of teachers in institutions encouraging the older form of learning and insisting that their students develop critical thinking and listening skills. But the, the opposite is also, is also true. There are a lot of teachers uh, making their students a lot more confused. So with this knowledge, I wish you good luck. Mm -hmm.